Today we're going to look at the 210 budget and Chancellor Davis is, um, if you're going to um, come up and address us and we'll go line by line. Uh, if you have anything you have to open with, um, um, do so and then we'll take the 210 budget and go page by page, line by line. Is this microphone on? Can you hear me? Uh, I do feel as if I'm in church and I'm about to take a collection because everybody moved to the uh, far side of the room uh, there. I just wondered the budget's not quite that large, but uh, let me uh, thank you again for this opportunity uh, to, uh, again, discuss our uh, FY10 budget. But before I do that, let me thank you uh, for your attention to and your recommendations on the FY09. Uh, budget. I, I appreciate how difficult a task uh, this is given the current economic uh, situation, but I do want to suggest to you that the university system has been and continues to be your partner in the effort uh, to uh, serve the state and its 283,000 uh, students with quality public higher uh, education. Uh, today, of course, we're here to discuss the FY10 uh, recommendations, and I'd like to put them first in a bit of context. Uh, the university system, uh, indeed all of higher education, continues to be uh, the driving uh, engine for this state's current, and I do want to continue to stress future uh, economic growth. Uh, this is true in a good economy. Uh, it is also true uh, in a bad uh, economy. Uh, in fact, one can make the argument that when the economy suffers, the importance of higher education is, in fact, heightened. Uh, higher education is truly an investment that adds value to the state. It adds value to the communities we serve, and it, of course, uh, adds value to the individuals uh, who are educated. Uh, but the point here is that everyone, everyone benefits from higher education. As you are aware, we have 35 institutions across the state. Uh, before the FY09 uh, reductions, our budget was $2.3 uh, billion uh, for the current fiscal year out of a $6.1 billion uh, total budget, of course. Uh, this appropriation of $2.3 uh, billion represented 12 percent uh, of the state's budget. The annual economic impact uh, of the university system on the state uh, is uh, $11 billion. Again, a very significant impact. Uh, and what underlies this impact, and I think uh, Representative Smith uh, understands uh, completely, it all starts with research. Uh, we bring research into the classroom uh, to inform our teaching mission. We disseminate research uh, into the marketplace and to the public sector. Uh, research and service are not tangential uh, to our work. It is central uh, to what we do. Uh, through research, of course, we educate your children, we grow your crops, we innovate uh, new products, and we solve uh, transportation problems, uh, if given the opportunity. Uh, so as we look at the FY10 budget recommendations, we really can't lose sight uh, of this fact, that our mission, our instruction mission, is enhanced and benefits from many of the line item uh, units that and our special funding uh, initiatives. Uh, for example, all of our line item units are attached to a USG institution except for uh, Skidaway. Each of these units serves an important purpose. Just like any engine, some parts are big, uh, some parts are small. Each of them does not stand alone, uh, but together they make up the engine that drives the university system and propels the state's economy. I want to just re-remind everyone of this and how interconnected all of these elements are. together they make up what is really the university system of Georgia. The university system has, like all other state agencies, undertaken some careful review of programs in light of the budget and the governor's call for budget reduction plans. And we have taken the needed actions to bring our budgets in line with the reduction targets. We have met every single reduction target set for the university system and we will meet every target given to us. For FY09, this stands at $239 million uh, in reductions. Uh, I have outlined in previous presentations to you how we've managed those reductions. 
and we will continue this course for management of FY10 reductions. Uh, the philosophy of our management is first, protect the core mission of teaching, research, and service. Uh, protect our students. Make reductions that are as best and as feasible, strategic, long-term, and permanent. Uh, and we really don't want to mistake the urgent for the important. Looking at the FY10 recommendations, right now we have a 10, we're looking at a 10.8% cut. That's about $250 million uh, to our base budget. Yet we have added, in spite of a $250 million reduction, we've added 23,000 23, additional students over the past two years. Demand for our services is exploding at the same time that resources are declining. Unlike most businesses that slow down in an economic downturn, our experience is exactly the opposite. We are seeing more uh, and more people working to manage, uh, again, their careers uh, and jobs uh, in this environment, and we are trying to manage growth uh, in this downturn. This puts added pressure on us to manage increased demand with diminished resources. That's our challenge, and I do want to point out that we are meeting that challenge. Our actions reflect our understanding and belief in the central role of the university, that the university system plays in the economic growth and vitality of this state. Investments in the USG should result in demonstrable and measurable returns to the state's growth and to the success of its citizens. Uh, we must continue to add value as a result of the investments being made in public higher education because they are substantial investments. If we don't continue investing in higher education, however, the state will absolutely pay the price down the road. You will see this in lower tax revenues and higher social welfare obligations, whether it's prison costs, health care costs, welfare costs, and on and on. We are managing, as I have pointed out continually, a very significant risk. It is not the risk of degraded service. It is the risk of getting it wrong as we prepare Georgia's uh, future leaders. And we certainly need your help and your support to get that right. So I want to look at some specific areas in the governor's budget recommendation for FY10 uh, on your tracking document. And I hope my numbers and page numbers uh, coincide with yours. Uh, our critical teaching mission begins on page 8 uh, of your tracking document. Uh, some of our special funding initiatives which support teaching, research, uh, and service are found on pages 6 and 7. Uh, I'm going to have a few comments on these three areas, uh, and then we'll be happy to take any questions that you might have. Uh, if I could turn your attention to uh, page 9 of your document under section 39, I want to focus just on two uh, critical additions. Uh, section 39.20.9 is $109.7 million added for formula-generated increases. This is due to enrollment increases, maintenance and operation increases. Can I interrupt, sir? Yes, sir. Uh, that's page 11 on our tracking document. Is that correct, Scott? Okay. 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 The so, reference, so, the so section if references. You'll are give still us the time same. to catch up with okay. you. Give us the exact number. 39.20, is that what you said? Right. 39.20.9. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chancellor. Okay. So we just got a different tracking document, page number. But okay. The I same hope the section stay the same. Okay. Uh, that's $109.7 million. Again, that's for formula generated increases. Our formula is made to address our increases in enrollment maintenance and operation costs as we bring new buildings online, our retiree funding, and health insurance. Uh, the single biggest driver in that number is credit hours, which comes from enrollment. Uh, in FY08, we had 270,000 students. The total credit hours uh, for all of the students for summer, fall, and spring increased by 277,000 credit hours uh, over the previous years. Uh, the increase in credit hours for FY uh, 2008, along with fringes and M&O funding for new space, uh, translates to that number, to the 109.7 uh, number uh, in the formula for FY10. Very importantly, however, you should note the, that the formula used to generate this recommendation does, in fact, have a two-year lag uh, in enrollment. It's designed to help us pay for the education of students we had in 2006. 
which was FY 2000, the FY 2007 formula, not the 33,000 who have enrolled since then. So our formula does not address 33,000 students who have, have, have enrolled uh, since then. Uh, the only way we can address that is through productivity. Uh, section 39.20.8, this is 7.75 million to continue the critical expansion of the Medical College of Georgia's physician education efforts. Uh, the funding there for that 7.75 million is in two parts. 3.75 million is for the hiring of deans, faculty, and module directors to develop the curriculum obtain accreditation and to do all of the steps necessary to admit the first cohort of students in the fall of 2010, uh, which is FY 2011, of course, at our MCG UGA partnership campus uh, in Athens. And we are on track uh, to do that. The other four million of the 7.8 million is for the expansion of residencies, uh, not only uh, in Athens, but also in Albany uh, and in Savannah. And again, it's about 10 to 12 resident slots in each location. Um, I will point out just one reduction, however, uh, and that is section, uh, actually uh, in this section, 39.20.5. Uh, among the reductions listed, uh, if you look on line three, you'll note a reduction of 1.828 million, which is a reduction to the Georgia Southern IT program. Uh, this is not a reduction to the program. It is an elimination uh, of that program. Uh, this 1.8 million presently funds 24 positions, 13 of whom are faculty. There are currently over 500 students enrolled uh, in the College of Information Technology, and almost 7,000 students are taking at least one or more courses through the college this year. Uh, that's a more than 7% jump over the previous academic year. Um, let me go to special funding initiatives. So I think you'll go back in the other direction to 39.15. I'm not sure what page you're It was page 6 of the document I have, so it's probably 8 on the one you have. I'm going to call your attention to three recommended reductions in this area. Uh, the first is 39.15.4, which is a $600,000 reduction which would eliminate funding for North Georgia College's uh, leadership initiative. Uh, North Georgia College is one of only six military colleges uh, in the nation, and it fulfills a vital role in the country's defense. Uh, through the education and training of military officers. Uh, this special funding item sustains a critical component uh, of that mission. That's right, 39.15.4. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, this 600,000 uh, sustains a critical component of North Georgia's mission by creating a unique leadership program that serves not just those students pursuing a military career, but others uh, at North Georgia with leadership capabilities. Uh, this cut we find especially ironic because uh, last month I introduced to the Board of Regents the number one ROTC cadet in the nation in the entire United States is at North Georgia and is uh, benefiting from this program. Uh, section 39.15.5, 39.15.5 is a recommended $5 million reduction in MCG's research funding. Now this marks the end of a five-year commitment uh, to boost research funding uh, at MCG. Uh, so it is very legitimate to ask, the assembly made a five-year commitment, what have we gotten for it, how have you used that money? Uh, because we do want it to continue. 
Uh, the funds have been used to put together startup packages uh, for researchers. Over the five years of this program, we've seen a return on investment grow from approximately 1.6 million in FY05 when the program began to a projected 9.8 million in FY10, and it will be 11.1 million uh, in FY11. Uh, this funding ex is exactly the type of smart investment funding that reaps significant rewards for the state in terms of outside uh, research dollars. Uh, Dr. Ron is here and can certainly talk more about returns on research and the productivity of our researchers uh, at MCG. Uh, section, and this will be the last section I'll point out, 39.15.6, 39.15.6. This eliminates funding for Georgia College and State University's liberal arts mission. Uh, 1.24 million. Uh, that amount of money helps the university maintain the small class sizes required to have a true liberal arts university. This was an experiment when it was put in place. This has been a fabulously successful experiment. If you read Kiplinger Magazine's uh, list of best buys for liberal arts institutions, uh, you will now find Georgia College there. If you look at average SAT scores uh, in this state, Georgia College uh, will soon, will have passed uh, Georgia State and may pass UGA. Uh, it is an exceptional institution. It, it should be a point of pride for this state, just as the College of Charleston is a point of pride for South Carolina, just as the College of William and Mary uh, is a point of pride uh, for Virginia. This is a gem in our midst. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, let me stop right now again and thank you for the opportunity to provide some context and to highlight a few of what I believe are the more significant FY10 recommendations both up uh, and down. Uh, I as well as the team here assembled are ready uh, to take your questions on these or any other uh, recommend line items in the budget. We've tried to make sure that we have the requisite uh, people here to address uh, your questions. If we cannot address them, we will provide you uh, follow-up material, certainly in a very timely manner. So again, uh, thank you for the opportunity, and we stand ready uh, to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Chancellor Davis. We're going to um, appreciate you bringing the highlights up of, of what you um, have on your mind for the university system. Uh, we're going to probably go through this line by line, but we do have two questions right now. And of course, I've got some relating to um, um, priorities. And uh, let's start with um, Representative Yates, Chairman Yates. 39.20.5. By the way, if, if anybody has a tracking document, um, the, the numbers. Um, match, but our page numbers may be incorrect, so give us a little time to turn to that. Yes, sir. Uh, $800,000 <coughs> Griffin Campus uh, infrastructure, that was put in, in cash in the 2009 budget, and then the budget director told me that uh, they changed it into uh, bonds for this year. That's correct. And uh, so what does this mean in this entry in here today? This, I believe, is just the cash portion that is coming out. Is that just carried forward from the 2009 or something? Is it still in bonds? Yes, yes sir. Okay, thank you. Representative Yates, I mean, uh, Representative Bob Lane, Chairman Lane. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chancellor. Uh, yes, sir. Understanding that I got a vested interest, I guess you would say, in this question. I'm sure you know where it's coming from. Uh, and that is on 3920.5, uh, the Georgia Southern University IT program. Yes, sir. I just, uh, I mean, you know, I know, I, I know this is the governor's budget, and I, but, but I never have had anybody explain to me, I mean, I can't see any rhyme or reason why the state would go out and build a $33 million building just a few years back 
and here we are just a few years down the road when we've had a program that's been highly successful. It's one of our, it's, I guess it's one of our programs on the, as you, as I guess you'd say the cutting edge information technology, information systems and all. I can't understand why we would have a cut of this magnitude that pretty much eliminates that program. Did you ever hear any discussion as to why uh, this this was even proposed? I mean, it, it doesn't make any sense at all to me. I mean, not, not any sense at all to me. Uh, I have not had uh, any discussions uh, with OPB uh, on these items. Uh, I did go back uh, or made a suggestion on all of these items, which is that we certainly as a system understand the need of the state for us to make some reductions, but suggested that uh, in lieu of specific reductions, uh, we would be better served if we were given the amount uh, and we would commit to meeting those targets uh, without having uh, specifically identified uh, programs. Uh, and so we certainly uh, would welcome suggestions as to why or where we may find uh, reductions. I, I certainly uh, uh, welcome those not only from OPB but from uh, the committee in, in other parts of the legislature uh, as well. But uh, what we would like to do is to just understand what we have to achieve and then let us use, uh, I think, be better processes in order uh, to get to it. And so I certainly from, uh, again, it is uh, the governor's budget. He does have to balance uh, priorities within the state. We are willing to work uh, with him to do that, but however, I cannot be supportive of these particular line item reductions. Well, I appreciate that, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, those that were familiar with this building that we built, the Information Technology Building, and and uh, and I guess as a follow-up to that, the creation of the School of Information Technology, uh, knew that this was one area in the state that that we lacked uh, adequate workforce in. I, I mean, I think it came out of discussion that the uh, former governor had had with, with Michael Dale, a Dale computer, that we just, uh, we wasn't getting, we were, we were anxious to, 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 to recruit that kind of industry to Georgia, the, the uh, computer industry and those kind of things, but yet we didn't have the workforce is what we were told to, to get, the, to, to attract an industry to have that kind of uh, industry locate here. So this school, as a result of that, was built really for that program, to train a workforce that could get good, clean industry that were high-paying jobs and that kind of thing, and it's working beautifully. I mean, we've got, uh, you mentioned the success it's had. I think you said they were, if I'm not wrong, that there were 7,000 students enrolled or in either classes. There or are 7,000 students that are taking at least one, one IT course, that, which is taught by this uh, program and again it's not a reduction in the program it is a complete elimination exactly. uh, of the program uh, I mean I'm just trying to make this point I mean yes, I sir. allow me to do that I mean I, it, it's just uh, it's beyond me with the success it's had with the with the I mean we're, we're hiring I mean we've got industries all over this state that are hiring uh, graduates and people who study in that college to just totally eliminate that program I didn't I mean, I, I'm making these points because I'm sure not everybody in this audience is aware of what's actually happening there, but uh, just want you to know that we're going to be doing everything we can to try to secure those funds. Thank you very much, sir. Representative Smith. Chancellor. Yes, sir. Um, uh, did I hear you right when you said that you submitted the budget, your recommendations, and then there was no dialogue between you and OPB as far as coming up with a governor's budget? Uh, again, no. Every year the process is we sub submit uh, a budget uh, and we get, and that is our, what we wish and what we think is appropriate uh, for our system. That our requests, of course, have to be put in the context of all other requests. Uh, from the state, we understand that. Excuse me a second. Uh, all I need is a yes or a no answer. Uh, did, I did once, have... once you submitted your budget, was there dialogue between the Board of Regents and OPB as far as the governor's uh, budget recommendation? We have ongoing dialogue uh, with them. I do not have uh, 
person dialogue. Ms. Ramachandran does have dialogue, so I don't know how much uh, dialogue uh, went on. So I mean, if you want some specifics on a particular topic, I mean, she'll be well, I'm, to I was just concerned because I heard, I thought I heard you say that, and then I also heard that, I think I heard you say that the process needs to be improved, um, like re based on Representative Lane's, that you did not agree with that cut but yet it's in there, so I'm, I'm a, I feel like, based on what you've been saying, that there has not been adequate dialogue between you and OPB as far as merging the two budget requests. Well, again, I think we need to understand that having reductions uh, in what you request versus reductions in what is already there are two different things, and this is the first time at least I've experienced those reductions. They happen very quickly. Uh, you know, we have received several adjustments uh, during the year. Uh, and so, uh, again, I'm sympathetic that OPB is looking always uh, for areas where we can make reductions, and I certainly uh, welcome their advice on it. I, I think we have some difficulty with specific uh, reductions where, uh, again, we believe that they have a higher priority then obviously have been reflected uh, in OPB's thinking uh, because they were included on a list and we of course would not have included them uh, on a list of reductions. We did not submit a list of reductions uh, in our budget. Uh, we put in only the formula increase uh, and the special funding initiative for uh, physicians expansion. I believe that was the sum total uh, of what we submitted. So the reductions of course were all new uh, to us and we understand the need for them. And as I indicated before, we will meet any target, but we have some difficulty uh, with some of the specific reductions. Thank you, sir. Chancellor. Yes, sir. I've got a number of questions, and I'm sure the lights will come on as we go forward. Um, what are the, <clears throat> the bottom line to the university system? What is its number one goal? What are its, what are its priorities uh, going forward into the future? Well, as I tried to say, um, we have a three-part mission. Uh, research informs our teaching and it informs our service. And so <clears throat> research, uh, both basic and applied, is critical uh, to what we do. Uh, and so, uh, again, we will our priorities are to maintain our research uh, mission to, uh, again, protect the students uh, in the classroom and also to protect the dissemination of that research. And I think that is critical as we look at these specific line items. Because as I suggested in other forums, uh, that farmers do not read our technical journals, which is why we have Ag Extension. Uh, we have marine extension because uh, shrimp boat captains don't read technical journals. We have to get the information out. That is how we move the barriers of knowledge uh, in society. That's how we make it more productive, more efficient. That's how we put new technology in the workplace through many of these activities. Again, I understand I'm perhaps not answering your question directly in terms of the number one uh, priority, but uh, we have three equal priorities, and they are research, uh, teaching, and service. I was hoping that you might say we're going to put a man on the moon again in some fashion where the University System of Georgia leads the nation in some overall goal. And um, as my good friend from out west said, um, got to have a dream, a vision, a goal. You write it on paper. Yes, sir. You find out what it costs, and then go find the money. And I'm sitting here looking at at um, 102 million in change for the 10 budget, and 239 million in change for the 09 budget as cuts. Mm -hmm. That's a total of 343 million. That's a third of a billion dollars in cuts. My question to you, once again is if we had a dream, a vision, and a goal, don't you think we could find that money somewhere, uh, maybe convince OPB and the governor that we're on a mission to, to cure cancer or cure something and be number one at something? Is, is that not a fair question to ask? I think it's a fair question. 
we do try and make a, as strong a case as possible in our budget presentations. Uh, again, we, and we do that to the governor and his team <coughs> with OPB there. Uh, but again, he also and that team have to look at all other presentations from all other agencies uh, of the state. So I'm not going to question uh, their judgment. Uh, our request uh, is there. When you talk about the equivalent of putting a man on the moon, we are actually uh, not in this budget, but you will see in subsequent uh, budgets in terms of our thrust uh, in biomedical. Uh, we are looking to develop Fort McPherson. Uh, for example. We want to put a research park there. Uh, that will re require a lot of money, uh, whether it's for a shared wet lab, whether it's for a supercomputer uh, facility. We're talking in the hundreds of millions of dollars, but that's probably two or three years into the future. Uh, again, but we do have a vision of what we want to do there, and that's going to be a very significant thrust going forward. Follow up again. If you had a vision to a uh, third of a billion dollars may not go away. Maybe you could get more than a third of a billion dollar if you in fact had a vision of, of curing cancer, curing deafness, or curing the transportation problems that we currently uh, are blessed with. Um, well, we're trying to do all of those things, and perhaps we haven't articulated them uh, as well. We're doing a wonderful job in trying to cure uh, cancer in concert with the Cancer uh, Coalition. You've been extremely supportive of our efforts uh, at uh, MCG, and we have a, a growing presence there, and I, I'm sure Dr. Ron will be happy to detail, uh, if you wish, later on what we're doing uh, in those areas. But all those areas you mentioned, we are working uh, in them. Uh, the biological sciences are the area where you're going to see a big thrust, but it's going to be in two or three years. Um, Chancellor Davis, you know, we've talked about um, a proposal that I have, or we have, a group that we've been working with. It's called the Site to Grow Georgia, Science, Innovation, Technology, and Energy to Grow Georgia. Um, and, and with that, uh, you have to look at alternative financing mm -hmm. and also entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have a study committee or something going forward to talk in that regard because the, the, uh, the people that we're working with are saying that these should be the top priority for the state of Georgia. And what is the, the, the man to the moon? I don't know yet, but I certainly don't hear it, um, if I'm mistaken, I don't hear it from university system that when the 09 budget, the governor cut 200 and some odd million dollars out, we didn't hear anybody jumping on the roof saying, hey, we're going to find a way to get the money. We're going to find a way to prioritize science and innovation and technology and energy. We didn't hear that. And yet, if you look at the 09 budget, most of what the House restored in our subcommittee and in the, in the full appropriations was just that. And here we have the Medical College of Georgia with a cut of $5 million and nobody standing on the roof jumping up and down saying we're going to restore that. Um, all these things is all about the future, and where's the future? And that's, that's what I'm trying to hear from the regents. Who's jumping up and down from the Board of Regents, from your office, to say Georgia's going to be number one in science and technology? Well, I would confess that we're not jumping off roofs, but I would like to jump here, and I'm talking about the uh, $5 million uh, here, and that was specifically uh, identified, and we have brought charts to show you the return <coughs> uh, on that investment. Uh, we are not the decision makers uh, on the revenue. We are, we are takers of your decisions, of the governor's decisions. Uh, what we have to do is we have to sell the efficacy uh, of what we do. Uh, we believe that, uh, for instance, on this issue of the $5 million, we can demonstrate that there have been fabulous returns to this state. We have that data here uh, to share that uh, with you. We have data on where our research, our medical researchers rank in this country, <coughs> and it is impressive uh, data. Uh, we will put that before you, and you will make the decisions on the priorities. Uh, we made our decisions on priorities with our budget submission. Uh, we did not ask for $300 million in uh, 250 and uh, the 234 this year uh, in reductions. We understand the need uh, for reductions, but it is also one of the reasons that the changes we are trying to make in the system are permanent changes so that we can operate efficiently at different cost levels versus temporary uh, changes, which we don't think serve us. 
uh, that well. Clearly, there are some temporary things that we are doing, but our focus has been on let's make changes that will help us strategically uh, going forward. Uh, and so uh, you, you are right, sir, but uh, again, uh, we have tried to make our case. If it's ineffective, we appreciate being told uh, that, and I know you didn't use those uh, words, uh, but uh, again, we can demonstrate the value uh, of what we're doing. Uh, we want to be held accountable, but we also want the public uh, to understand that that $5 million investment has generated tremendous returns, uh, and we would like to continue uh, with that investment. <coughs> Mr. Chancellor, yes, sir. Are, are there any members of the Board of Regents present today? Um, I do not believe there are. Uh, are there any members of the Board of Regents ever present at this subcommittee? Yes, sir. Uh, Could you name been, one? Uh, yes, sir. Regent Jenkins has been, yes, sir. Uh, I believe, uh, to the last meeting. And when to the Joint Appropriation Committee, uh, re there were, I believe, four regents uh, at that meeting. How many regents are there? There are 18. Let's talk about um, enrollment. I saw that you, you're, you're saying that we're enrolling 277,000 more credit hours than the previous year. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Is there a reason why we have that large a number of credit hours increased from last year? Is it, is it at the two-year colleges versus at research universities where the priorities perhaps should be? or? Well, where is this demand happening? Okay. And, and, and as another question uh, along that line, um, are we prioritizing, are we letting advertising people to come to school uh, just to go to school and get a head count and get a full-time equivalent just to say that we've got people in school? Because according to your numbers back during the January, you said that that um, the enrollment has gone up 27,000 in the last three years. Is it, it bet the University of Georgia is standing pat, and they've only gotten 17 percent increase over the last six years, while the other three cert, three year research universities have gotten 48, 52, and 56 percent respectively mm -hmm. increases over six years. Mm -hmm. I know that's a long question, but I'm trying to figure out once again where the priorities of the Board of Regents are. We are a, a public university system. We hold ourselves out to educate all uh, who are, in fact, uh, qualified. We believe very strongly that we should have an educated citizenry. We believe that it is critical to the functioning of a, of a vital and vibrant democracy. Uh, and so, uh, again, we have different types of universities. Uh, we have uh, large research universities, such as Georgia Tech, Georgia State, uh, UGA, and the Medical College. We have four-year comprehensive uh, institutions, 15 or so of those, and we have our two-year access uh, institutions. They all have unique uh, and different missions and serve a different purpose. If you look at the profile of the distribution of students in this state versus other states, you will find that we have a far higher percentage of students in the state of Georgia going to our research universities than other states. So we are already research intensive rich. 40% of our students go to one of four uh, research universities, excuse me, 30% uh, of our students go to one of four research universities. 40% go to the comprehensive uh, universities and less than 30%, less than 30% go to the two-year comprehensives. Uh, back to your earlier question, uh, we have credit hour growth at every level. Uh, primarily through at the research institutions through graduate students, where, is, where it is exactly where we want to have the growth. Uh, we have more robust growth in the two-year institutions. Uh, again, the credit hour growth there has been faster. Uh, and that also is good from a state perspective because at UGA, for example, we, it cost us approximately $12,200 per student that we have to put in support there because of the cost. It costs us between four and five thousand dollars per student uh, at the two-year access institutions, and so the model we would like uh, is to have more and more of our students, a higher percentage, uh, at the two-year access institutions, uh, and then transferring into the comprehensive and into the research institutions. But again, if you look at what percentage of our students go to research institutions, it is a higher percentage than in most other states. 
you, you mentioned that, the, you, that it was spread out amongst the research universities. Well, if the University of Georgia is only getting 17% increase over the last six years in total FTE expenditures, how can you say that the University of Georgia is being evenly distributed with the other research universities? I'm still, I've asked this question four times and I'm still yet to figure out how the University of Georgia that has to, the flagship university, the land grant university, cooperative extension, research, and, and all the other things that go with the University of Georgia, but they still only get sent funded 17% increase over the last six, six years, while the others are 47 to 56. Our formula is essentially a growth driven formula. So, uh, that means we have more students coming into the system. We have to address the cost of educating those students at every level. Uh, we do not have robust growth at <coughs> UGA. We're not looking to have robust growth at UGA. One, uh, there is, we believe, a reasonably optimal size for research institutions. We're not trying to create Ohio State with 55,000 uh, students. They, too, uh, large research institutions, if you look at the trend of them, have been downsizing. Uh, Ohio State has gone from 55,000 down to about 50. The University of Wisconsin has gone from about 50 uh, down to the low 40s. They're looking for that optimal size. UGA is about 33 to 35,000 students uh, at the moment. And again, it is a much more expensive educational proposition there. Now, let me try and address, really, I think, the, your point, which is, and again, I don't want to put words in your mouth that UGA has in some way been disadvantaged in our distribution of money. Uh, we believe, uh, again, it's a magnificent institution. Uh, it should be supported. It should be supported robustly. But if you look at uh, the allocations that UGA has received versus its credit hour growth versus what other institutions have received versus their credit hour growth, you will get a different picture. You will get a picture that says they have received a disproportionately higher share of the revenues versus a lower share. And again, we will be more than happy to put that data in your hands. Now, if the question is, have they received adequate funding, then the answer is no. They have not received adequate funding. If they had more funding, they could do many more of the magnificent things that they do. However, uh, we also have 35 institutions in the system, many of which are growing explosively. And unless the policies of this state suggest that we should restrict uh, uh, students coming into our institutions, then uh, we feel very obligated uh, to welcome those students. And we don't welcome them just because they generate credit hours. We welcome them because we want to educate them. Uh, we want to turn them into productive and contributing citizens for the 21st century, and we're very proud of the job we do in doing that. <clears throat> Follow up with the university. Yes, sir. Uh, so what I heard you to say is you froze enrollment at the University of Georgia because somebody arbitrarily said that a good research university size is 32,000 students, but yet the other research universities are spiraling upwards at the thousands and over the last six, seven years. And herein lies one of the problems in the state of Georgia. We've got first, second, third, fourth generation Georgians that can't get into their alma mater because there's an arbitrary freeze on the enrollment there because this is the model size research university. Uh, we hear this all the time. I'm sure you do too, but there's got to be some solution to this home state university that, um, that, that many of these third and fourth generation students want to get into. Yes, sir. Uh, we, we do have a challenge. Let me talk about the issue of freeze because I have never used that term in any discussion uh, mm -hmm. with UGA. I believe that there were some probably informal discussions about what is the appropriate size of a research university uh, before I got here, but we certainly have not had those discussions since I have been here. Uh, let me continue to stress, however, that it is extremely expensive to educate a student at a research university. At a, a state has to make in excess of a $12,000 contribution to support a student. Uh, 
uh, expansion of infrastructure, expansion of anything uh, in Athens at this point uh, is expensive. Is it impossible? No, it is not impossible, but it is uh, expensive. From a state perspective, it is more cost effective for us to try and get students to recognize the quality of our other institutions. Uh, as I said, we would like uh, to students to start in two-year transfer institutions. They get excellent educations there. Uh, the data suggests uh, that they do as well or better in their junior years than those who start uh, in our four-year uh, institutions. And so, uh, again, it is cost-effective and educationally effective. Now, in terms of can everyone who wants to get to UGA get in, the answer is no. The answer will always be no. When we expand it, if we expand it, the answer will still be no. Uh, because uh, of their success, they have raised their standards. Uh, it is an elite uh, research institution. And again, the contention, both from in-state and from out-of-state, will grow as its excellence grows. Uh, and we will always have the problem that uh, you know, everyone who wants to get in cannot get in. This is not the situation that it was 30, 40, uh, 50 years ago, uh, where there was room for anyone who wanted to go to grow. We are also a much larger state now. Uh, and so again, uh, it's a, an elite research institution. We have to learn to accept that. Uh, that you know it it has higher and higher and will have increasingly high and increasingly selective uh, standards. Uh, other research institutions have, and you are correct, experienced growth. As I tried to point out, uh, Georgia Tech, for example, has had pretty robust growth, but it's been in the graduate uh, area, uh, where again we we often can seek funding from outsiders to support uh, graduate students in research programs. Uh, we get that. Uh, Georgia Tech has an extremely robust research program. They're supporting a lot of graduate students uh, through that. So we'll be happy to show you where the credit hour growth has occurred. The bulk of it is in the access institutions, and that is where we would like to see uh, the bulk of it. And I believe that is the best proposition for this state uh, as well from a public education perspective. You said that uh, growing um, research university is extremely expensive. The University of Georgia is flat, 32,000 there about. Georgia State has gone from 18,000, almost 30,000 in the last 10 to 12 years. How much more does it cost to buy land in Atlanta than it does to buy land in Athens? I, w I don't know that. I Again, from the nature of your question, I would suspect uh, you are in the realty business and you know better than I, I would suspect it costs more uh, in downtown Atlanta. Uh, our goal for the new president uh, of Georgia State is not necessarily to expand from a facilities perspective, but instead to fill the facilities that we do have and to increase the scholarship levels. That is our goal uh, at Georgia State uh, at the moment. Uh, we have expanded uh, where we had uh, space uh, but again, I'm not looking for great undergraduate expansion uh, at these institutions. I'm looking for more research expansion, graduate student uh, expansion, uh, instead of undergraduate student expansion. And the getting into UGA issue that you raised is not a graduate issue. It's an undergraduate uh, issue, and we're really not looking anywhere to robustly expand the number of undergraduates at our research institutions. You, you mentioned that you could get information as to the 17% versus the 48, Absolutely. 56. Absolutely. I, I really would like to see how you come up with these numbers because I'm still at loss. I hear yes, you and I, uh, over and over, but I'm still concerned that a, that a university that has all the responsibilities that it has as a land grant, as a cooperative extension, uh, the other marine and et cetera, um, how they are still s shorted that much. Um, research. You said that um, the, the, we have all these research plans out there, Georgia State and others. That, do you have a way to, to put these research dollars into real jobs that you could say, yes, this research produced this many jobs, or this research produced this much um, th that brought grants in to further the research. It's like a, a dog catching his tail, I guess, but um, um, 
I know we got to have it, but do you have some way to ascertain cost benefit? Maybe the words I'm looking for. I think to a limited extent, and people will cringe when I use the word limited, uh, I believe we do have some ability to trace, for example, what sort of economic activity uh, has been generated by our discoveries. And again, when we talk about the process of translating discoveries uh, into jobs, uh, that is a very complex process. It is not the job of a researcher. Uh, for example, to translate that research uh, into jobs. Uh, we have, we do basic research, we do applied uh, research. And again, we need, as we get more and more applied, as it moves from basic to applied, you can start to see the transition uh, into jobs. And so what we try to do is to create an environment of discovery. Uh, we are, we have just convened a working group of all four vice presidents of our research institutions. We are trying to leverage our intellectual capital. We are trying to make sure all of the researchers understand what others are doing. And so we can leverage, uh, again, the process of discovery. Uh, we are taking a harder look both internally and in concert with the Commission for New Georgia on the process of how do we get from basic discovery to applied research to the development of new businesses uh, and jobs. And so, uh, again, there are measures uh, in various areas to tell you, you know, how many jobs we've created through what technology. You know, I would be uh, remiss to suggest to you that we have some great global overall measure which says this is how productive our research is because in many ways one can make an argument that we shouldn't measure necessarily research just uh, in terms of jobs. Uh, again, the basic research purpose is to move the frontiers of knowledge forward. Chancellor, um, I, I notice there's no Board of Regent members here. Are they, are they involved in these decisions relating to uh, 32,000 frees at the University of Georgia, or the, the growth in the research, or is this the people at your office and yourself? Uh, our board, uh, when functioning correctly, will operate at a policy level. Uh, again, I don't know who had discussions on what is the appropriate size for the University of Georgia. Those discussions uh, took place well before I came uh, upon the scene. And so, again, I would think, however, that that would be a matter uh, of board policy if it were to be uh, discussed. Uh, no board member has come forward. Uh, to suggest that UGA uh, should be larger uh, than it is. Uh, but again, I think those are, uh, those are legitimate board uh, discussion items. Since, since no Board of Regent members are here, how will they be debriefed on this series of meetings that we'll have? Will they be debriefed uh, verbally? Will they be debriefed with a memorandum? Or will they watch this um, um, archive? Uh, I do not uh, know whether they're watching this now. Prior to this meeting, I certainly alerted the chair, uh, the vice chair, and the chair of our business and finance committee uh, that we would be reviewing uh, the budget following this meeting. I will go <coughs> back uh, with a correspondence with them and uh, suggest uh, what areas were covered, what, were the fo what was the focus of the discussion. So, so let's go back to the Board of Regents. Do they have a man-to-the-moon goal where they set priorities, whether it be science and technology or research, or we're going to uh, grow 277,000 credit hours at the two-year schools? Or, or At what point does the Board of Regents get involved in spending taxpayer dollars like this with a priority? I mean, I, I mentioned... Uh, my friend out west that said you have a dream, a vision, a goal, you put it to paper, you find out what it costs, and then go find the money. Are we not doing that at the regents level? Uh, yes, we are. The Board of Regents has expressed its priority through its strategic plan. Uh, it is a six-point uh, strategic plan. Uh, I didn't stay in a Holiday Inn Express last night, so I'm going to take the risk of trying to enumerate uh, all six of them uh, up here. Uh, the first uh, is an enhance and improvement in undergraduate education and the quality uh, of that education. So we are doing such things as revisiting the core, looking at our international programs. So there are an entire set of activities under that. 
Uh, the second is to make sure that we do have the capacity uh, to accommodate uh, students. And so, again, our strategy is to try and get students to go start in our two-year access institutions and to recognize the quality of our other institutions. Uh, the creation of Georgia College was in response to, again, trying to get students to understand that we have quality other than at our research institutions. That experiment has been a fabulous success to the point where we're now capping uh, enrollment at uh, Georgia College because we want to keep the classes there small. Uh, the third, and again, uh, is a focus on having a research uh, and economic development footprint. We understand what our footprint is. We want to have a larger footprint. Under that, you will see the development of Fort McPherson. Uh, you will see the development of l satellite uh, research parks. Uh, Need-based aid uh, is one uh, of our goals uh, as well. Uh, to, we understand that there are kids for whom the light comes on late uh, in high school, that they do not have GPA sufficient enough uh, to get a HOPE scholarship. That generation or that cohort, a p large percentage of them is falling uh, through the cracks. Uh, and so we want to make sure that they also participate uh, meaningfully and productively in our society. And we think they need need-based aid in order to get there. There will be a focus on generating more resources for the university system through productivity and efficiency. And through that thrust, you'll see us uh, combining our back office operations so that we can save money and plow that money back into our research and academic missions. Unfortunately, that money now is being used to offset uh, reductions. Number six, help me. Yes, and uh, the last is to make sure that we have appropriate educational partnerships uh, with the K through 12 system, the technical college system, and the pre-K system, that we have created the Alliance for Educational Agency Heads. We meet uh, every other month. Our goal is to have a seamless education system here in the state to move from uh, the pre-K into the K through 12 system and out of that system into the technical college system or the university uh, system. Uh, those are the six priorities as enumerated by the board. Uh, they spent some time uh, debating and discussing those. Uh, and again, our budgets are policy implementing documents and so our resources will tend to be allocated along those lines uh, as well. And so, uh, again, there is a process for the board to get involved in policy making. It is up to us, however, uh, to fill out up those policy mandates with programs that achieve the policy objectives. Chancellor, when, uh, uh, we've got several questions here, but um, Chancellor, w when you were, um, could you get him some water, please? Oh, I have some bottles. Okay. Some. Thank you. Um, Thank you very much. W when you were with the gas company, as the CEO of the gas company, you have annual goals. You have a short-term, mid-term, long-term goal. Did did you? The name of your company is irrelevant, but let's just say it's X Y Z Gas. X out X Y Z Gas is going to be number one in America. Was that ever your goal there? And if it was, why is it something like that in the university system? I've heard you four and five steps here, but I haven't heard going to the moon. When we got some of the most incredible research universities, libraries, public broadcasting, uh, K-12, that we could all dovetail, break the silos down, and, and reach this goal. What is the goals? Yeah, I, um, again, don't want to leave you with the impression that we have modest aspirations uh, for this system, because we do not have modest uh, aspirations. Uh, I don't think curing cancer is a modest a goal. Uh, but again, there's a limit to any goal to which we can devote all of our resources. Uh, we cannot do that. Uh, we have a broad-based mission as a public university. Uh, we have to educate. We have to do research. We have to do service. And so really what you're talking about is our prioritization uh, process and how we do that. Uh, we try to do that, as I suggested, guided by a plan. Uh, and a plan, the plan does reflect excellence. Uh, excellence is on a comparative basis. Uh, is it undergraduate excellence? Is it fundraising excellence? 
Uh, and so, again, uh, we don't have aspirations for mediocrity in any of the things that we do. Uh, but we're doing a uh, – we touch every segment of society. And so, again, we have goals, lots of different goals in lots of different segments. And I appreciate it would be easier to say let's do one thing. Uh, but that's not what we're structured to do. Uh, and as I suggested to you earlier, I think some of the things we're planning in the biological sciences will, in fact, respond to uh, your concerns about big picture items. But these big picture items, I should warn you in advance, are going to come with big tickets uh, also. So when I come here in two years and say I need 150 to $200 million for a supercomputer, uh, I will probably re-remind you uh, of this discussion. Uh, Chancellor, I like the word excellence and number one and, and so forth. Uh, uh, could you tell us what the m motto of the Board of Regents is? Um, you know, it's written on my badge. It's, uh, it's a better know. educated Georgia. Okay. Yeah. What about a, the best educated Georgia? Uh, Secretary Chokas. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chairman Smith and Chancellor Davis. Um, we were talking earlier about the University of Georgia, and we're talking about its growth and in, in the future. And a couple of the questions that I had dealing with that dealt with infrastructure and not necessarily with land acquisition, but um, what capacity do we have at UGA now? What uh, are we? Ex at that capacity, are we exceeding that capacity? And if 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 the um, the 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 uh, I guess the will of the with the of the border regents or the will of the university is to grow to larger capacity, what type of uh, funding requirements would be needed? Would we need to be looking at more bond packages? What if we're looking down this path, as I I, I hear Chairman Smith saying? What is needed, and, and would we be pulling away from someplace else? How would that work? Well, let me start with the last question, and that is uh, it's a zero-sum game uh, every year. We get an allocation, uh, and we have to figure out how to make that allocation. Uh, the regions are, in fact, uh, concerned in a scarce resource environment how that allocation is made. We are having a series of meetings with them to discuss what are the appropriate allocation parameters uh, upon which they should base uh, a decision. And so we, when we get to the allocation in um, May or June, uh, it will be made by an extremely informed, the decision will be made by an extremely informed board uh, because we will have a series of workshops uh, that to educate them uh, and which will culminate uh, in that decision. Now, in, in terms of the physical capacity uh, of uh, UGA, I don't know really what its physical uh, capacity is. Uh, I do know that uh, we do not want to create a situation where we have few tenured professors and every class is a large lecture and you go to a recitation section taught by uh, graduate students on an ongoing uh, basis. And so, uh, again, when you're talking about expanding, uh, in general, you're talking about bringing in uh, significant professorial uh, resources, all of which come with a high price tag in a research uh, environment. And so particularly, and if you want to move up in your rankings, then you attract superstars. Uh, in order to do that, uh, you pay. Uh, for it. You have to put together packages. Uh, we put together packages at MCG. Uh, that's what we were using the five million for. Uh, that's now been eliminated uh, from the budget. And so, uh, again, we could give you detail on uh, the number of buildings there. Uh, I would have to go back to the people at UGA to talk about utilization of those facilities. But, you know, I don't know really of many facilities within our system that are suffering from great underutilization. Uh, I have you know, more information on uh, utilization from those entities that are growing very quickly that are using laboratories from 7 in the morning till 9 at night and still can't cope uh, with the student growth. 
that's where we have to put uh, uh, investment in those types of situations. Yeah, could I have one follow-up, please? Okay, good. Um, the, when you said that the excellent in 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 uh, professors, uh, which leads me to to think of eminent scholars and the eminent scholar program that we have in the state, mm -hmm. and um, maybe you could help us on this. Or, or how is the funding towards that? I know it's a public-private type of investment, and uh, I would be able to attract stellar. Uh, professors because of that? Uh, we have uh, essentially two types of eminent scholars. We have those that uh, are at the $500,000 level where uh, the institution has to raise a $500,000 and the state uh, put a, provides a match. There are three of those uh, in the present budget. Uh, uh, two are at Georgia Southern, the other is at, at Kennesaw. Uh, then we have the GRA eminent scholar program and the price tag there is about 750,000. Uh, but uh, again, uh, let me suggest that this is also a function of how much reach the state wants to make. Uh, you know, I can assure you that uh, we have the ability to raise more matches than the state has put forward in terms of uh, its match. Uh, and so, uh, again, that's the status of that program, those programs right now. We can certainly give you uh, the exact number of scholars, but if you look at the GRA scholars, uh, for example, and you look at what percentage a small number of scholars brings in in terms of research of our total research, it's an astounding uh, percentage. And so these are fabulous investments. Uh, but again, the point I try to make through all these discussions is that we are creating the future. And so the future requires investment. Uh, we have data that can show you that the investments that you have made have, in fact, paid off. Uh, and so we are at a point now, however, where re investments are being reduced. Uh, and so, uh, again, the point we're making is that you will not see the impacts of those reductions next year. You will see the impacts of the reductions in the future, or should I say, in the lack of a future uh, going forward. Thank you. Representative House, House Tone. Thank you. One quick question. Yes, uh, ma'am. On page 12. Wait, you have to give me a tracking number. My oh, page tracking. numbers are different. I've yours. got to give you the tracking number. Yes, okay. ma'am. 39. 20.8. 20.8. Uh-huh, 20.8. And then 39.20. Wait, wait, wait. wait. Okay. 39.20.8, that's the 7.75 million. Okay. okay. Yes, ma'am. All right. So uh, it looks like the governor put in 7 point million there. <laughs> Y'all requested down on 39.20, you requested 8 million. Nothing was put in. What are the two differences in these two numbers? Uh, there is no difference. So One is just a reduction of the other. Mm -hmm. Well, usually, okay. But why didn't he... Uh, I mean, it's, it's odd that when he reduced it, usually, you know, they make a cut and put it out beside. These are like two different entries. Yeah, I have the same problem with this document <laughs> that you're uh -huh. having. In I fact, it, so usually when we see it, it's cut some. It's not cut on a different line by taking it out and putting it in. And I had a problem with that. He explained to me about uh, 2010, the cut in your residency program. 39-2010. Reduce uh, personal services and operating expenses in the resident uh, instruction program. Uh, do, 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 do. Yeah, this is our our budget, our 10 percent, 10.8, 10.5 uh, percent budget cut. How much do you get in your residency program? Is that 10 percent? It's, it's not residencies. This is resident instruction. A resident instruction. Yeah, this okay. Is, All right. This is not residencies. Yeah. Okay. This is our total instruction for the system. Oh, okay. Thank you. I, was yes, about, I, I wonder why Dr. Ron didn't say something. <laughs> Thank you. Actually, he said I don't have that much money to cut. <laughs> Representative Smith. 
Chancellor, on, uh, and, and this is just a, uh, an area to start, on 39.1.4, you are, in that particular one, you're proposing to eliminate three field positions, five vacant, and then reduce general operating. How many, 39.1.4, first page, how many layoffs are you anticipating in this budget? I know you've talked about the elimination of uh, the IT program at uh, Georgia Southern. So we're, we're looking at layoffs, we're looking at elimination of programs, and um, also I've seen in here the, uh, the eliminate, does that eliminate mean really eliminate or does it just put it on hold till next year? Let me uh, defer this one to Dean Sheehan. Okay, thank you, Chancellor. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Representative Smith, uh, on that particular one, uh, certainly. Uh, what, what, wait a minute before we. Uh, what's the question? Okay, on thirty-nine point one point four, it starts off eliminate three positions. How many positions? At, at where? Well, I don't care where. I, I'm looking at the total board of regents. Okay, but I'm talking about for the total Board of Regents, university system, how many positions are we anticipating laying off? How many positions are we, because we talked about leave five vacant positions or eliminate five vacant positions. Are we talking about leaving those five vacant positions open until next year of the following year, or are we talking about eliminating? We have presently in excess of... Microphone, please. Thank you. Uh, we have presently in excess of 1,300 positions uh, that are either vacant or filled on a part-time basis. Of that 1,300, 800 are administrative. They are, in fact, vacant and not being filled. Uh, there is an excess of 500 that are faculty positions. They are generally being filled by adjunct professors or part-time professors. This is not a sustainable position for us uh, because while I won't comment on the quality differential between adjunct professors and regular professors, and I hope there isn't, there is a big difference in their ability uh, to advise students and to get students more engaged uh, on the campus, which is key to their moving uh, through the system. In terms of actual layoffs, uh, so far there's been uh, 62 uh, layoffs of people who were in positions and had those positions eliminated. Uh, I expect that number will go higher uh, in the FY10 budget. How much I, higher? I do not have a number, and one of the reasons I don't have a number is that we have delegated the management of the task to the presidents, and so we have to give them their FY10 task they will, after the budget is passed, they will then come back and tell us how they're going to manage that, and it will, will not be until that time that we'll, where we will learn exactly how many people uh, will be laid off. And so, again, that gets to the sort of decentralized nature uh, of our operations. What the presidents have said to me, uh, as I have suggested uh, to OPB, just tell me what the number is, and we will manage to it. But uh, I can't tell them what the number is yet, and they can't tell me what they're going to do until the number is firm. We'll put it in place, and then I'll have, then I'll know after that. And so, all I can tell you is there, there's 62 in FY09. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't expect that to go lower. So you anticipate more? Um, in, in, kind of adding this or putting these two together, you, you're looking at reductions, but. Uh, with the elimination of the IT program at uh, Georgia Southern, how many other program eliminations are we looking at uh, system-wide? Again, if... Um, Based on this budget. Yeah. Uh, in, in terms of the, uh, the specific programs, uh, again, I, I'll have to go through all of these. Uh, where you see cuts on this sheet, and particularly where you see cuts in the special funding uh, initiatives, we're looking at uh, program eliminations uh, to a large uh, extent. Uh, the, our real question is, uh, of course, uh, you know, can we afford or allow that uh, to happen? Uh, 
uh, and if not, what can we do? Uh, and uh, again, we will make that decision after we have uh, the final allocation. Chancellor, last year um, I had a legislation that would have reorganized higher education. Yes, sir. And obviously it was in the legislative body, it was met with, with um, accolades, but it was met with opposition from the Board of Regents and others on that side of the fence. And what we were trying to do is break down the silos. That means that, that Georgia Public Broadcasting the Student Finance Commission, K-12 or P-12, the technical colleges where we, in the first run, we were combining the technical colleges and the two-year colleges to call them a community college, which is what they do quite often throughout this country, and then the university system. All of these would work together, break the silos down for one meeting a month. Um, some would be voting, some would non-vote. And obviously we met resistance there, but what brought that to me uh, was that the frustration that I didn't see dreams, visions, and goals coming, and here we are about to cut a third of a billion dollars from education, higher education. I don't know what it is in K-12, but I'm wondering, I haven't heard anybody with the Board of Regents or the Chancellor's Office screaming bloody murder, don't, don't, don't. And, and we hear, it's like, well, okay, how high do you want us to jump this time? And I'm very concerned that, that that the lack of response, the fact that no Board of Regent members are here, the lack of response to to uh, the governor's shaving Georgia Southerns, one, they're one of the tops in the world for what they do. Uh, Georgia State College in Milledgeville, you mentioned them there. They're uh, MCG and five million here. Georgia Research Alliance. We had to beg to keep seven and a half million in last year, so that the private sector would fund thirty million. Oh, by the way, California's three billion dollars. Maryland and Massachusetts a billion, one and a billion. New York, Texas, Florida. Everybody but Georgia's in the big picture scheme. And I'm very, very frustrated that what I said a while ago: dream, vision, goal. Put it on paper. Find the money. And, and I promise you, if you had some dream, vision, and goal, we'd find the money. Personal question to you. Yes, what is your dream, vision, and goal for Georgia's higher education? Uh, well, again, um, I, I want to address, uh, I guess, your, your frustration first on that. Uh, I was going to be uh, more histrionic here, but we're on camera, so uh, right. sort of uh, it's more subtle here uh, today. Uh, we put forward what we w want. Uh, but we also understand that what we get is put in the context of all other state needs. Uh, and there are other state needs. Uh, and we, that is why we are working with other state partners. There are tremendous needs in K through 12. They have real problems there. Uh, there are tremendous needs in health and human services. Uh, we would like to stay ahead of corrections. Uh, we would like to stay ahead uh, of road building. Uh, but again, uh, we recognize uh, those needs. You know, our and my own personal goal is to make sure that we are excellent, uh, and that excellence is in fact expressed uh, in our plan. Uh, it is not expressed in a single goal. Uh, but again, I think many of the things that uh, you are and the types of things that you are looking to see, you will see uh, over the next several years based uh, on our plans. Uh, particularly in terms of research expansion. We do have a goal of having a much greater and greater impact on this state and on this nation. Uh, and we are doing things to help us achieve uh, that goal. Uh, and again, we have, uh, I was in a meeting last week uh, with people who are potential tenants uh, of Fort McPherson. You know, I've met with the CDC. Uh, and so we want to bring all of these parties together, large parties, uh, to do great and good things uh, at Fort McPherson. Uh, but there are a lot of steps uh, in that process. And again, I uh, perhaps it's the way we go about things. I'm not prone to making big pronouncements before I know we can achieve them. Uh, and so, uh, as I said, we will be back. We will be back with big asks uh, 
Uh, and again, uh, I will remember this conversation and I will look for your support uh, at that point in time because these will be expensive propositions uh, that we will be bringing forward over the next several years. But I think they are worthwhile propositions in terms of moving this state and this society forward. What is your dream, vision, and goal for the university system and for the state of Georgia? Uh, that it be an excellent place where people from every walk of life can receive education in an environment that prepares them to be productive and contributing citizens in the 21st century uh, and that the education that they do get is informed by excellent research. I've got a few individual ideas, intellectual properties. Mm -hmm. Intellectual properties on the university research campuses. Um, uh, there was a story sometime back three, three, four months ago in the Atlanta Business Chronicle where there was a university, uh, I don't recall what, sc what school it was, but they, they had a patent on some, some research that they had done and perfected some dry eye chemical mm -hmm. uh, for animals. And, um, and some particular university sold the, the, the patent to the private sector for less than what this person thought it should have been. Having said that, if you could address that. And the second thing, has the university system ever looked at the Stanford model or at the Nangang Biotech Incubator model in Taiwan? Uh, I cannot say that there are not people in our system that have not studied uh, those models. I don't know. I would assume uh, that they have. Uh, each of the technology transfer models at the research universities are slightly different. Uh, but they also conform to some national norms, uh, which I want to point out makes the process of changing those risky. Uh, because not only are we dealing with researchers in this state, we're also dealing with researchers uh, who are collaborators uh, with our researchers from other states. Uh, and there are some national norms and national models which they expect in terms of sharing uh, of revenues, sharing of success. Uh, and so we need to be very careful when we start talking about changing the intellectual property uh, process. But that is not to say that it is perfect. That is not to say that it should not change, but we should use caution uh, when we do that. Now, with respect to the instant case that uh, you spoke of, I'm really not intimately familiar uh, with that case. I had heard of it in passing, but I am not really familiar with that case. Uh, are, are you not familiar that there's a, a, a lawsuit pending in that uh, regard? Yes, and I generally leave that to our, our lawyers uh, to deal with. So. Let's talk about your libraries on your campuses. Is there, is there a library on every campus in your system? Uh, libraries, the nature of, yes, there is. The, but okay. the nature of libraries is changing. The library that I went to, where I would go to, to get a book or, or to sit there and to read is not what our libraries are today. Uh, they are learning centers and learning communities. So you will find if you look at our new libraries that there's an emphasis on group rooms where there's group study and people come together uh, and utilize the resources. And we've also, as you are aware, uh, leveraged the resources of our libraries through our Galileo uh, system And so, uh, again, uh, there are libraries. Their function is changing uh, over time. Chancellor, would you, I'm going to present this to the subcommittee at some point and have been talking with others about a potential pilot library in both North Georgia and South Georgia for the public library system, of which the regents control the funding um, and construction, and also a pilot university um, library of North Georgia and South Georgia uh, for the Library of the Future. Are you familiar with what the Library of the Future may look? No, but I'm sure Dr. Beach is. He is here. But, He's but, in, but in any event, this is something that that if I can convince enough members and maybe convince you all that, that we come up with an architectural drawing for both an, a, a new Library of the Future as well as a Library of the Future that could be attached to an existing library. Um, and when I say that, I'm talking what you just said, that technology is such that, that we may not need to, 
And this is all about funding. Everything we're talking about today is about the bottom line, how we fund going into the future. And libraries is one more of those where your volumes of books aren't used as much as they were in the past. Uh, maybe they are, but I'm, I don't see it. Uh, and they're using more computer, more Google, more Kindles, more of this. And, and one model that um, I've been talking with Dr. Lamar Beach and his library group that, about this subject, um, they're excited about it because um, they know that libraries are changing. But they also have a record number of people coming into libraries as opposed to last year and the year before because of things that are changing. Yeah, but I just wanted to see if you had a, 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 any heartburn in that regard to, to go forward with maybe a capital um, uh, I, I will candidly have to find out from Dr. Beach whether I have heartburn. Uh, or, or not, but I'm sure I won't. But let me, for a moment, because you made an excellent point uh, about libraries and it's about money, uh, because we made a very significant breakthrough in this state with the establishment of Galileo. Uh, it allowed uh, resource poor institutions to have access to many uh, or the same resources that research rich institutions have. Uh, and we announced this in this state with great fanfare, with great moment. It wasn't exactly the man on the moon, but it was, in fact, trend setting for the nation. That system is now at risk because we cannot afford to continue to buy all of the databases uh, that we do need uh, for Galileo because of the reductions, because uh, of our budgets. Uh, and so, uh, again, it's an, one more example of the equivalent of building a brand new building but not providing the money for maintenance. We put in a brand new program, a brand new structure. We have to maintain it. We have to grow those databases and we have to have money and funds uh, to do that. Uh, and so again, that remains a challenge uh, for us at the system level to make keep Galileo valuable. Uh, because what we're having now is that those institutions uh, which are, in fact, uh, do have resources, can buy individual databases which the entire system does not have. And that was not the intent of the Galileo system. That brings me to bricks and mortar. Uh, we're, we're not going to talk capital projects and the uh, individual projects today, but it's a, the big picture is the same as the library of the future. <clears throat> We've got millions and millions of square feet of buildings on all the campuses, both technical and library system, and the university system, public broadcasting. There's so many incredible, incredible infrastructure things that we have in Georgia uh, where we could take an existing building and use technology. Now, some of these on this panel have gone to see Cisco. It's a Georgia company uh, relating to uh, the future technology. It is absolutely incredible that, that, that the technology is here. It's a Georgia company. The Georgia company um, that that, um, that that we need to utilize, if not Cisco, something like that is going on in this camp, this this um, um, system. I'm, I'm confused here, but where we could take this this um, this type of technology and reduce the amount of requests for square feet of bricks and mortar every year, and take existing campuses, student learning centers on the various campuses, we could even update those. Even though they're state of the art, they're still falling further and further behind every year we go by. Is that not correct? Uh, that's correct. And we put money in last year's budget uh, for expansion of our uh, distance learning and distance classrooms where one could uh, utilize a classroom at Georgia Tech. You've been to see that and see that uh, and have that broadcast to Georgia Southern, have it to GTREP have it to Armstrong and have it to uh, Savannah State. Uh, that money was in the budget. Uh, as I said, we now have a 10.8% budget reduction. Uh, and so, uh, again, all of this costs money. And the question is, how do you prioritize it? And that's really you know, what we do, what you do. Chancellor, um, we're probably going to do a, a billion one, billion two, maybe even a billion three in capital projects this year statewide. I would love to see, with, with your help, working as a team with us on this committee to, in the libraries and the public broadcasting to try to put together something very quickly 
that, that we can fund technology in the 10 budget, uh, maybe a seven-year bond technology for this Cisco-type technology or for the libraries, for all of these uh, that we have. K-12, could um, and we could partner with them, but primarily we're interested in higher end. But to have a satellite or pilot in north and south Georgia, both for the libraries and the public and library for the university system, I don't know how, I don't, you just can't pull a number out of a hat. We've got to have a plan in mind. Mm -hmm. But we can't wait another year for technology. What we have, what we have seen, uh, classrooms you could use right now, and Representative Chokas and um, who, you went, didn't you? Who else went with us? Scott? We had about eight members to go, and um, um, they'll agree that some classroom technology is already here. That could save bricks and mortar. Existing buildings, existing uh, bricks and mortar on campus. Uh, if, if we could work on that real diligently and quickly to try to come up with a package to, to do that. Um, well, we have the HDTV data ready to go. I can assure you that. If you'll bear with me a minute. Talk about health insurance. Um, obviously, that's a fairly heavily line in the in the uh, overall big picture of the university system budget. <clears throat> and in the past, we talked about the university system's health insurance versus state health benefit plan. Mm -hmm. um, some have said that it's a Cadillac of health benefit, or the Cadillac of health insurance. Uh, how would you compare dollar for dollar? the university system's health plan versus the state of Georgia's health plan. And and give us a, 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 a summary of, of what you're doing in the university system to cut the cost relating to the health care. Okay. I'll be happy to do that. Uh, first of all, uh, let me, if I might, paraphrase your question a bit because uh, we do not by making a dollar per dollar comparison assumes that you're comparing the cost of identical things and they are not identical. Uh, I don't know whether I would use the word Cadillac uh, to describe it uh, and those who are in it would probably use something worse because they've been asked, just asked to pay a lot more uh, for what they're getting. Uh, but the program is meant to, res is designed to respond to the needs uh, of our employees. Uh, one quarter of our employees are professors. These professors travel all around the United States. They travel all around the world. Uh, they go into residence in different places around the nation and around the globe. Uh, and we need insurance programs that will address their needs in those locations. Uh, that is what our program is designed to do, uh, to address the needs of academics. Uh, in terms of uh, its cost, uh, the, in terms of what we're doing to manage that cost, uh, we are offering incentives in terms of lower premiums for high deductible uh, programs, which will in fact cost us less. Uh, and we have also shifted uh, the, a burden, a higher premium burden, onto uh, the individuals uh, in our uh, indemnity program to get them to try and move uh, to other programs, uh, and they are, in fact, migrating uh, to those programs. And so uh, the, major the state of Georgia's program is designed to address the needs of the employees within the state of Georgia, uh, most of whom are all resident within the state of Georgia. Uh, that is not the case uh, for our program. And again, just as we have uh, a separate uh, pension program uh, that, uh, in fact, responds to the needs of those uh, who move from place uh, to place. We have a different insurance program as well. Tuition. Yes, sir. Tuition. Usually when we leave from this place, the legislative body leaves, the tuition goes up. And I know what you have to do is look at your budget, mm -hmm. see what you're dealt 
the, the hand that you dealt, and then you raise tuition accordingly. Yes, sir. Um, however, <clears throat> Dr. Adams from University of Georgia has come in several times saying our tuition is too low or it's lower than the, the normal. And yet we got 247,000 more FTE hours in the university system. It tells me that, that somehow with the spigots open and we're just turning it loose just to get FTEs from the Hope Scholarship Grant or so. And um, I'm wondering if, we're, if we need to close the spigot for the supply and demand cycle to work. However, um, I, my son is going to, um, to get a master's degree in architecture. And at four of those campuses where he's applied and been accepted at Notre Dame, Yale, Miami, and Texas, the tuition. <laughs> it's 42000 to 62000 including some room and board. Um, do we have a bargain? If we don't, um, in some systems, I, I'm still I'm still concerned about the rapid increase in, in in FTEs in some of the campuses, while the University of Georgia is frozen. I, I'm I'm concerned about tuition being too low in some places. I'm trying to get a handle on that because we you know we did this the, the yes, study sir. on the salaries both compression mm -hmm. and otherwise for professors last year. Mm -hmm. And we did the MRR study last year. And we see these things that are, we're never going to catch up, it doesn't appear. Something's got to give. Mm -hmm. And when I have to get a loan to send my son to master's school, master's um, college, um, I'm, I'm starting to question, are we too cheap in Georgia? Mm -hmm. I need, a, need something to, to um, um, you know where I'm going with this yes, answer to the question. Uh, let me, uh, if I can, try and res uh, respond uh, to that. Um, <clears throat> when I first came here, um, I, I had this same conversation with Dr. Adams, uh, and he pointed out to me appropriately that our tuition is among the lowest uh, in the SREB region uh, for four-year uh, schools. I forget what the number was uh, back then. Uh, but my response... Uh, my response was, because something is low, does that mean it should be higher? Uh, and don't we have the best of all worlds because we are delivering a high-quality product, which is acknowledged around the United States, at a very low cost? And then I would pull out my own chart, which showed not tuition, but tuition plus the state support. And tuition plus state support for students three years ago uh, was not near the bottom, but in fact near the middle. So I said, thank you very much for your arguments. See you next year. Times have changed. This, you and your colleagues in the legislature have been extremely supportive of the university system. My first three budgets uh, were increases of 6.6%, 10.5%, and 7.7%. But support per capita per student has gone down because the number of students has exploded uh, in this state. And so now where we were in the middle of the pack three years ago, if you added tuition plus state support, we are now fourth from the bottom uh, in terms of tuition plus state support. We are not necessarily a low cost state. We are a low tuition state because of the amount of support we got from the legislature. Given our explosive population, given uh, the economic times, we cannot rationally expect that we will get tremendously more support from an already supportive legislature. And so that means we must turn to the tool of tuition. Uh, and if you look at, again, where our tuition is, uh, it is near the bottom. Uh, uh, for our four-year institutions. So now there is a reason or a justification, should I say, you know, we can raise uh, tuition and not price it out, out of the ballpark on a comparative uh, basis. Uh, we are looking at any number uh, of tuition schemes uh, right now and discussing those uh, with the board. We've reached uh, no judgments 
uh, on those. Uh, in terms of support from the legislature, when we first started uh, the tuition program, the assumption was uh, that the legislature will provide under the formula three quarters, we would provide one quarter. Well, that has degraded to about two thirds and we're getting one third uh, now. Graduate school tuition, however, we freed last year, it is at the market. So schools can come in with proposals to charge graduate rates comparative uh, if they have, a pro we have sets of comparators uh, for each school and as long as it is at the market, uh, we will tend to uh, approve that. You did not see a tremendous jump uh, in, however, in uh, graduate student rates because a, one of the reasons is that just as you uh, as a parent are concerned about the cost of education, so are many departments which in fact support graduate students. So those departments don't want to pay high tuition uh, as well. So that put a natural damper uh, on that. Uh, but uh, we're looking at a lot of different uh, schemes. We're concerned about in-state, out-of-state uh, tuition. We're concerned about price elasticity. Uh, we've looked at models around the country, for example, where institutions uh, jacked up their out-of-state tuition, as many suggest we should do here, and they found out that there was a lot more price elasticity than they had imagined. Uh, this happened at the University of Wisconsin, an excellent institution. The legislature said, you know, we want the out-of-state rates uh, to go up. Uh, they responded. The number of out-of-state students went way down. Uh, and so, uh, again, we have not made a decision, but we're looking at a lot of different models. And the only thing I'm prepared to say at this point is I don't see any way that tuition is probably uh, not going to go up. Mr. Chancellor. If you have 25,000 baccalaureate degrees every year, roughly, on the university system, do you know where each and every one of those have their first job when they graduate and how much they make? Oh, I do not. Their data is collected at the individual institutions in terms of where their graduates go uh, and, uh, you know, by placement offices. Uh, foundations track uh, their graduates. We do not track them uh, at the central office, and so I really can't respond uh, here. In so so what you're saying is is that you, if you have 25,000 baccalaureate degrees out of a 280,000 student population, you don't know where they got their first job and how much they made, which means are we graduating students to have an onion skin or a piece of paper that said they graduated from something? Or are we graduating someone to, that actually goes into the opportunity force or the job force? And you can't answer that question. Oh, I cannot answer it from a central perspective. But what I'm suggesting is that the data are there at the institutional level for the most part, and they can tell you where their graduates uh, went, and you will often see them bragging about that uh, and the average salaries in their publications. So, so what you're telling me is, is over a four-year or five-year period of time that someone has been in school and they graduate and they may not, may not have a job, may not have something to do. They may be on the unemployment line, and we don't even know that, although the taxpayers of Georgia are spending billions of dollars over the last few years. and. Um, I'm trying to get a handle on that because my follow-up question is going to be, if you did know, then maybe we could say your tuition could go up based upon success rather than failure because we don't know if you're failing or succeeding because, and I, I'm confident that we're succeeding, but we just don't, uh, the, the cost-benefit analysis is just not playing out here. Yeah, let me tell you what we do know. We do know the disciplines in which they graduate. We do know the market demands for disciplines, and in our planning, uh, our program planning and our academic program planning, we try to match, again, what society needs and wants versus what we are uh, teaching. Our STEM programs respond to that, uh, for example. Our teacher education programs uh, respond uh, to that. I can't tell you what each individual teacher 
uh, makes, but we can probably tell you what percentage of our teachers are hired uh, within this state. We can tell you how many, uh, what percentage of our teachers stay on the job for X period of time, and we can tell you what we need in terms of teaching discipline by the year 2020 and how we're going to try and, and produce those teachers for those disciplines. That's all done in our P16 office. I should also point out from another budget commercial that the P16 office is under attack, uh, and we're, we're getting reductions there. Uh, for what's done in our P16 uh, office. And so, uh, again, uh, we may not have the data in the exact format, but uh, we, are, we are not, I assure you, devoid uh, of data. If I could put my arms around, and I think the public could put their arms around this, um, that if you, would, if you could tell us out of 25,000 baccalaureate degrees how many actually have a job when they graduate or have one within six months or a year from the time they graduate and how much they make, how much they produce in this state or do they leave the state of Georgia and if they leave the state of Georgia are the taxpayers funding someone to leave the state of Georgia? Um, we, we need to get our arms around this because I, I can tell you this, this one third of a billion dollar cut that we're experiencing here, I think that legislators and the public would jump on the mountaintop and say no more cuts. We want to enhance this because of this, this, and this. We just don't. We can't put our arms around this because we don't know who's failing, who's succeeding, and are the taxpayers getting a good bang for their buck? Mm -hmm. um, and that goes back to the dream, vision, and goals again. <coughs> yeah. Uh, again, uh, I think we're. Uh, I want to stress that some of the data you seek uh, is available if you want by discipline, but from particular institutions. You know, we can tell you where all of our doctors go. Uh, we can tell you, you know, what disciplines they are, where they go, where they work, how long they stay uh, in the state. Uh, but again, that's institutional data that comes up to us. We do not have a collective data on who's making what uh, in their first job. You know, for instance, the 25,000 uh, that you talked about, you know, we looked at that two years ago and said, there are three high school physics professors out of that 26,000 uh, at that point, uh, physics graduates, high school teachers. Uh, and so because of that, uh, we focused on getting that number up by putting in joint teacher training programs at Georgia State uh, and uh, Georgia Tech so that those students who are at Georgia Tech who want it uh, when they get to their third year decide they really want to teach but thought they should stay at uh, Georgia Tech, they now can get the teaching courses they need to go teach uh, in high school. And so, uh, again, uh, we tend to focus on the needs of society and what we're turning out versus what an individual is making. Uh, I want to follow up with you on the question. physics teachers. Once again, how many do you have last year high school physics teachers out of 25,000 baccalaureate degrees? Uh, I don't have that number on the tip of my tongue, but What's I suspect it? three, three, five. It was two years ago. It was three. I suspect it was probably in that neighborhood because the impacts of our program take time uh, to kick in. Right? We so la get last year, out. last year, uh, you recommended ten million dollars to stem the tide on this very subject, and it was it was denied through the governor's not recommending it. And I raised a point in this committee that why don't we raise the salaries from uh, for those that want to teach physics and math and science and, and, and specifically look at that target instead of starting a whole new bureaucracy just to talk about this. Let's get something done. Pay them 20000 more to start, and I guarantee you they won't work for ConocoPhillips. You, you are absolutely correct. Uh, there is legislation uh, in that has been introduced this session uh, to, in fact, do exactly that. That legislation is a result of the joint planning processes between the university system, the K through 12 system, and the technical college system, our alliance of educational agency heads. That, in fact, was one of the issues uh, we put push forward. I don't know the exact number. Lynn, are you still here? You, you have the number? The bill number. House Bill 280. Uh, does exactly that, and we have 
uh, and I hope that reference number is correct. Uh, but there is a bill that does that, that promotes uh, for our STEM professions higher starting uh, salaries because, uh, you know, it, but all of this takes time. Which we don't have time. We, we don't have time. Uh, 280. What if 280 doesn't pass? What do we do then? Uh, we will be putting more technical graduates into high schools. How long they will stay will be a function of the cell. We can get them in there uh, with the programs we have in place. Uh, as long as they have better options, people admit are going to act in their enlightened self-interest. Uh, they will go in and they will stay one or two years, and then they'll go out uh, to a master's program, then they'll go off to be uh, you know, investment bankers or entrepreneurs. Uh, and so uh, we have to make uh, these changes. Uh, we can't force those changes through K through 12. We can't fund them. You can uh, fund them. The bill is in front of you. Uh, I urge your support uh, of it. Uh, but again, we will make the changes that we can make uh, in terms of getting more technical graduates with teaching skills uh, because we're not going to get high school physics teachers unless there are physics teachers in high school who are physics majors who encourage students to go into the teaching of physics. A science teacher teaching out of classification is not going to help us create physics majors and physics teachers. It's not going to happen. So this is a long tail process, but we are taking the steps to do that. We're doing what I think are the appropriate steps. Why is legislation needed? Why can't the K-12 just um, have a line item put in the budget for, for this like we do every other line item? Uh, I believe, I don't know the mechanism by which the additional funding would be put in. Uh, I think that, uh, again, it will allow the legislature to make a statement about it believes that STEM discipline priorities are a high priority for the moment and that they should receive differential pay and that they are willing to support uh, that. Uh, if science and technology is a high priority, which I hope it is, then we can't wait long term. It's got to be now. It has to be now. How many um, teaching colleges do you have out of 35 units? Uh, to the three, uh, probably three to four years ago, we had 15. By the end of this year, we will have 22. I thought we had 31. 22. 22. By the end of this year. Yes. How many teachers do you um, graduate every year? About 4,800, about 5,000 teachers. We have committed by the year 2020 to turn out 20,000 teachers a year, which will meet what we project to be 85% of the state's demand at that point. How many do we need over the next three to five years? We have to just, it's, we have to ramp up. Are we still an import state? Oh, absolutely. How much? Uh, about a third. What's it take to get that done now instead of wait 10 years to 2020? Um, we could probably accelerate it, but again, it requires, there's a lot of infrastructure. We have to have the people to teach. We have to have the places uh, to teach, and so you know, we are ramp and the resources. So we are ramping that up. We could probably accelerate it, uh, but uh, again, it just it cannot be done uh, overnight. We'll probably have to have more teaching institutions uh, online uh, as well, and that uh, that is a process where we have to get accreditation, program development, all of those things. Uh, and we but you know, we're pushing. We're going from 15 to 22 over a very short period of time. Yes, sir. Uh, Chancellor, uh, changing, this, changing gears a minute, uh, I've asked Representative Chokas to, as part of the Democrat caucus, to um, um, study and follow the stimulus package as it relates to science and technology and anything that will come to higher education so that we will not miss uh, opportunities if we think they're good opportunity. If they're, if they're a bad mix and we obviously don't want to turn them away, but I've asked Representative Chokas to, to address this issue, and I'm going to let you speak to that. And, and, and I would hope that all the four research universities, anybody that has anything on the table, to try to engage this, this uh, subcommittee, and especially uh, Representative Chokas with this. Representative Chokas. Well, thank you, uh, Chairman Smith. Um, 
I've already had an opportunity to talk with uh, Tom Daniel about this, and uh, yes, sir. I'm in contact with uh, Washington as we speak about trying to find someone to uh, communicate with Shelley Nickel right. and uh, and coordinate that as yeah. best we can because uh, there's a lot of money out there they're going to spend it, and I want to make sure that Georgia gets its share, and maybe a little more than its share, and if. Uh, we could talk about uh, uh, some of the, uh, uh, I think some of the goals that Chairman Smith said earlier and some of the goals that you have. And one of the goals that I have is to, uh, to, to make uh, uh, our system where we have two state schools of excellence, our land grant schools that are, are uh, oh, I'm sorry. Our, our Representative Choke was waiting just a minute. I okay. didn't mean to disrupt. I was sent, he was in pain. So, um, <laughs> it wasn't from the question. <laughs> <laughs> hey, if you could grab the mic and swing it down, it would be great, sir. All right. Well, what I want to find out is uh, once we start talking with them in, in Washington, what, what, what is y'all's vision? What, what uh, goals do y'all have? Uh, well, I, we clearly share your goal of getting all that we can. Uh, into the state and you are correct that we have appointed someone as a point person for that she has been organizing discussions across the system particularly with the research universities and so uh, we know we have a good idea what's going to NIH and NSF and we have a backlog of projects that we can propose there uh, we know for example that 80% of the 1.5 billion discretionary funds that are coming uh, to the governor can be used uh, for education. Uh, they have not been earmarked specifically for higher education, but there are things in there such as longitudinal databases where, in fact, uh, we can utilize uh, the monies. And so uh, to, to that extent, we will be putting forward uh, proposals to utilize the, the funds uh, for that as well. But. Uh, we don't see large-scale, huge earmarks for higher education uh, in this package. Okay, thank you. So, so rec uh, Representative Chokas, where are you? Um, what is the timeline for us to hear some of these things? Are we going to see it before the session is over? I certainly hope so. As I said, I've been in contact with, with the folks in Washington. I started Friday when I talked with Tom, trying to make sure we could get this going. And I uh, want to take advantage of it as quickly as possible because I'm sure every state in the nation is going to be doing the same thing. Now, um, uh, the research universities, I'm sure you're talking with Washington, but please, if you would, um, communicate with Representative Choka so we can work as a team to to try to, if we have to do some matching, we need to know fairly soon. If, uh, are they going to be matches or are they going to be direct? I don't know that. Okay. Could we follow up with another conversation on this with, with y'all? It's real important that, um, that we don't get something that we have to match in perpetuity for something that we really don't want to do in Georgia. Um, members, I've, I've had a lot of questions and I have many more, but um, I know you're getting tired, but I have another one about furloughs. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm gonna stand up for this bullet. No, you can you can sit down. You can sit down. You probably need to sit down on this one. Um, uh, you can sit down. No, it sorry, it doesn't bother you. us at all, sir. Uh, lean against the rail or something. Yeah, I'll do that. Um, um, Thank you, sir. Furloughs. I don't th until two weeks ago. I don't know of anything else that members didn't tap me on the shoulder and ask me. Everybody else is doing furloughs, but the university system is saying, and I think I heard you or somebody in your staff to say publicly that we're not going to do furloughs. Uh, we're just not going to fill unfilled positions. Can you, in fact, furlough contract employees or contract professors? Can you furlough contract professors or employees? Um, to my knowledge, no. We cannot do that. We are obligated. Well, we can furlough them, but we'd have to pay them uh, what we're contracted uh, for. So, we'd if we're going to pay them, we would prefer that they work. Uh, let me say, I hope no one 
in this system has said we will not use furloughs. Uh, I said publicly that I was philosophically opposed. That was probably a bad choice of words. Uh, the furloughs are, from our perspective, a sort of a blunt instrument uh, to be used uh, when necessary, but they provide temporary solutions. The history of the cuts that we have taken in the system does not suggest to us that they are temporary. Uh, the ones we took in 2002, 2005, uh, those have all been made permanent. Uh, and so when we, were, when we received reductions, we took the view that we will have to learn to do what we need to do at a different revenue level uh, from the state. And so what sort of structural changes uh, do we have to make? Uh, and so we are going about the process of doing that. Now that is not to say that every change we have made uh, is in fact structural or not temporary because if you get large enough reductions that have to be achieved in a very short period of time, furloughs may in fact uh, be an answer. Uh, but understand that if we were to use furloughs as a tool, then we would only apply that tool to three quarters of our workforce. And if you look at the cost savings of furloughs, the one quarter of our workforce is cost us exactly the same as the, about the same as the three quarters of our workforce. Uh, and so you have one quarter of the workforce uh, which is, is as expensive as three quarters of the workforce and we cannot furlough them. Now what we can do, of course, is address a lot of these issues in future contracts and that is our intent to do that. Uh, our present contracts leave us with no flexibility. Uh, and so we will, in future contract negotiations and contract signing uh, with our faculty, look for a greater degree of flexibility uh, than we have today. Now, I fully appreciate that we also have some, uh, I don't know that they're necessarily unique to us, but other situations uh, which make it difficult uh, or, or or a bit problematic. Uh, for example, uh, we get 2.3 billion before reductions from the state out of a 6.1 billion dollar budget. That's about 38 uh, percent. And so, therefore, uh, there are there is uh, you know 62 percent of our payroll is some other payroll. It's a mix uh, or of our revenue sources. Uh, excuse me. Uh, and so, again, we have situations where people are working beside each other on different payrolls. We have people who are, who are being paid from two and three sources, and those sources sometimes change monthly. Uh, and so it is not the tool, and I realize uh, the state has hospitals and they have patients as well, so they share some of the same uh, problems uh, that we have. I would suspect we probably have more funding sources uh, than the state has. Uh, however, and so it's a difficult tool for us to use. It's not an easy tool for us to use, but if you were to say we had to cut significant amounts of money in a very short period of time, that may be the only tool that we have left. It's just, I should have suggested that it's not a tool of first choice for us versus being philosophically uh, opposed, and I appreciate that that was a poor choice uh, of words on my part, but nowhere did we ever say we're not uh, going to do furloughs. Uh, th thank you. Uh, I appreciate those comments because you can look around this room or perhaps a legislative body and see that um, th there's a lot of members suffering as well. Yes, sir. Um, and some of them don't have any, haven't made any money in quite some time. Uh, oh, by the way, someone's got a job. And I, I guess what I'm saying is at least they have a job, even if it means a day or two or three or four days. Uh, it goes back to the priority again. If we had a priority, or it seems like we had a priority, and we had somebody dancing on the rooftop saying, hey, we're not going to cut, we're not going to cut anymore, a third of a billion dollars. I just don't hear that from the Board of Regents. I don't hear it from many in, the, in some of these circles that, hey, we're sick of cutting because this is our priority. Once again, priorities, priorities, priorities. Mm -hmm. uh, relating to furloughs, I, I 
had a conversation with the legislative c council, and they said, in fact, you could furlough um, salaried um, faculty and professors uh, due to the economic constraints, and I'll share with you that after this meeting, but th th there is options there with the state of Georgia when it comes to times like this. If we were to, to declare financial exigencies, we could abrogate contracts. There are implications, great implications, to making that declaration, however, in terms of our recruitment of faculty uh, from other states. And there are greater uh, implications uh, to abrogating contracts. And so I understand while that. it may be technically feasible, uh, we do not believe from a long-term perspective uh, that it is an appropriately uh, feasible and certainly politically uh, feasible thing for us to do at this point. I understand that. Um, and Legislative Council and I discussed that as well. Uh, in light of that, uh, other states are hurting as well, so if they're furloughing, then they've got the same problem we have in Georgia because uh, uh, the implications from the other states. Um, Albany State, talking yes, about priorities. <clears throat> let's, let's talk about Albany State's football stadium. Um, could, could you tell me, you now we gave, um, we gave um, almost every president of every institution an opportunity to come before this subcommittee over the last four years and now five, and not once did I hear, maybe the members heard it, last year relating to a football field uh, being paid off. And uh, it was all about a Ray Charles Auditorium mm -hmm. uh, funding that, and it's in the budget as well, or at least a capital request this year. Um, and, and this was brought to my attention about a month after the new budget began for the uh, nine, 2009 budget, um, that uh, in fact the Board of Regents had paid off a two point two one million dollar loan that was secured at a local bank in Albany. And I'm just concerned that is this a priority for the university system to be paying off a football stadium when we've got university professors that are being asked to be furloughed. And a two point two two one nine oh four point oh seven loan was paid off in July twenty fourth oh eight, right after the new budget year began. Is this a priority for the University of Georgia? And if it is, why was it not brought to the attention of this committee? And, and where does this money come from? I, I, I'm trying to figure out where this money is coming from to pay off a 2.221904.07 loan that originally began at $10 million. Well, let me uh, ask um, uh, Vice Chancellor uh, Daniels uh, to come forward and, and discuss that. Uh, and again, if there's one thing in context that we want to put forward, it was, of course, it is, of course, that this was an approved project. And so, I don't. Ms. Usha is going to help? Okay. Thank you. You asked about the, um, where the money came from for the 2.2 million payoff of the, um, for the Albany Fund Stadium. Could you lean a little farther so we could, can anybody hear this? Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, you asked about the 2.2 million and where the money came from to um, to pay off the loan. It really came from two places. 1.2 million came from the auxiliary fund at the institution, um, and this is really um, you know athletics is one of the auxiliaries at the at the institution, so that's where the money came from. That's 1.2 million. Now the remaining 1 million was from one-time money that the institution had. And this was money that they were holding for um, institutional priorities. Um, I think it had to do with um, the quality improvement plan. And let's see. 
And this, of course, is a valid use of money, so we allowed them to redirect this money. Okay. What was the original amount of, of this particular loan, and, and how was the loan secured? Is there any security deed, or was there an instrument relating to that $2.221 million loan? This was money that was borrowed by the foundation, um, and it was uh, a loan from SunTrust Bank, and it was to complete the construction of the stadium. Um, SunTrust Bank generally doesn't make a $2.2 million loan without some type of security, whether yes. it be land or, or another foundation or perhaps money donated or whatever. There was indeed a security for the loan, and this was a million dollars, which is a portion of the uh, Ray Charles gift uh, to the foundation. So you're saying the Ray Charles gift was used as security for this loan? Yes. They used a portion of the money they got from the Ray Charles estate as security for the loan. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to get this right. that The Ray Charles estate gave money. What was the intent of the original gift? What was the intent of the original gift? I'm not sure about the um, original intent of, of the purpose, but it was certainly to um, further the institution. Um, and uh, I think part of it was for scholarships, perhaps. Is, is it not true that the Ray Charles uh, gift was for the Ray Charles Auditorium at Albany State? Is that not true? So, so was it for the football stadium or the, for the auditorium? There is some debate on the intent of the gift, and of course, uh, unfortunately, Mr. Charles is not here to clarify uh, that. Uh, I believe that he, he or his estate was advised that if he were to give money, they would name the auditorium uh, after him when it was built. Uh, now, do you interpret that statement to mean that if you give money, it is for the auditorium? And that is the next, the crux of the debate. Uh, and so the money was certainly given to the institution. It is the institution's intent uh, to name the auditorium after uh, Mr. Charles, but it is not at all clear from a legal perspective that the monies given were in fact for a particular building. And so some of the money was used for scholarships, some was used uh, as security here. That security, of course, has now uh, been freed up. And so it is not altogether clear uh, that that is a, uh, not an appropriate use for the money. Uh, and so again, that is a matter of continuing discussion between uh, the institution. C and could you tell me when the football State. stadium was built? I cannot. Two thousand one. Two thousand one. And where did the original money come for the football stadium? So, um, and at what point did they first borrow $2.2 million from SunTrust Bank? So, so let, let me just clear this up here. I'm, I'm a little confused here. Your Ray Charles gave money to Albany State to build an auditorium. And then we come to find out that one million of it is secured on a line of credit some way with SunTrust Bank for $2.21 million or so forth. And yet we've got a capital request this year in the 10 capital request budget for $2.3 million for the Ray Charles Auditorium. I'm trying to figure out, I'm trying to figure out where's the priority for the university system? Is it football stadiums? or is it professors, research, science, innovation, technology, and energy? Uh, again, the premise of your 
question was that the money was given for the facility. And again, I want to stress that that is a matter uh, of some debate that whether the money was given specifically for the facility, whether the money was given because a, to support the institution with the understanding that if a facility was built, uh, Mr. Charles's name would be on that facility. That is the interpretation, from my understanding, that is made uh, by the university system. Uh, the money was used, uh, as I suggested, for a number uh, of sources, one for scholarships, uh, for students. Uh, it was obviously used to secure this loan. It has now been freed since the loan has been paid and it can be put uh, into the building and I believe that is the intent to put money uh, into the building. Could, uh, could, you, could you further answer, if you had one million dollars of Ray Charles money uh, securing a 2.221 million dollar loan, where was the other 1.2 million secured? Is that a personal line of credit to the Albany State or to the Board of Regents? Or? Uh, I don't know that it required 100 percent securing of the loan. Okay. Now, so, so all of this chronology that I've spelled out, if we, we've talked amongst ourselves, was this um, approved by the Board of Regents? We had an approved uh, building. I mean, the payoff, the, the loan to SunTrust, can that be made without the approval of the Board of Regents? I'm not sure on the governance there. The, the loan was to the foundation. It was not to the Board of Regents. Okay. Uh, the foundation, so, so the SunTrust Bank had a $2.21 million loan. One million of it was secured by the Ray Charles money, wherever that is. And so the foundation probably backed up subject to debate, $1.2 million. I, I'm trying a little concern here. We got a, 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 is, I'm, I'm real confused about all of this, but we'll leave it at that. Um, Representative Houston. You said that this million dollars to pay out, to pay off this loan came from an auxiliary account. Is that the word you used? What kind of account was that? Yes. Okay, is that state funds in an auxiliary account or is it foundation funds? State money. It's not state money. Would you take the mic, please? Okay. Okay, auxiliary money is not state not money. Not state money, no. How do you get the auxiliary money? Okay. Now, the Ray Charles money, was it given to the foundation or was it given to the university? So no state money was used to pay off this loan? So no state money was used to pay off the loan? Is the general funds of the institution, which generally includes tuition and indirect cost recoveries and perhaps state funds? Well, it seems to me it's Perhaps state funds were used to pay off the loan. Dollars are fungible. I'll be glad to share the document that the chairman has at his possession with any member of the committee okay. at any time. All of the details have been provided on this. This is not a new issue. This is something that we have talked about for two or three years. So all of the issues are spelled out in the document which the chairman has I'll be glad to make available to anybody of the committee, and we'll spend any number of time going over any level of detail that y'all might have about this issue. Well, you know, when you just sit here and hear it for the yes, first time, it does sound, you know, with everything that's going on in banking. It's not and a new issue. Yeah. So I'll be glad to keep catch you up to any member right, of the thank committee. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I probably need to cut up as well. But <laughs> <laughs> this is before your time. Yeah, right? Well, I can't keep using that excuse. My time's getting longer. <laughs> Although it may get shorter if I can't answer more of these questions. <laughs> uh, Mr. Chancellor, uh, yes, sir. the question was raised for um, Representative House, and you want it? Okay. Uh, the priorities, once again. <clears throat>
budget is all about priorities. Yes, sir. And how do we go forward in 2010 budget is based upon that very thing. And I, the reason for raising this point is if we're paying a football stadium off, is that a priority or is it a, is our priority science, innovation, technology, and energy, or is it professor's salary saving them, or is it furloughs? Or where, where's the priorities? That's what we're asking, because if we have a set of priorities, then we can go through this line by line, and I'd like to do it one more time. We obviously, you've been up there quite some time, and I understand you had knee surgery, and I, we, we've uh, had, a, had several minutes with you, um, but I'd like to come back one more time line by line on this, but where are your priorities so we as a subcommittee can decide how we budget this year? Yeah, I, I uh, appreciate that quest, but I think I have to continue to make the point that as an educational institution uh, with varying types of institutions, research institutions, four-year comprehensive institutions, and two-year institutions, uh, it is difficult, if not impossible, for us to say that we have one priority. Uh, we have a strategic plan which expresses multiple priorities. Uh, and again, we will try and, and achieve all of those priorities to the extent possible. Uh, but uh, you know, your science and economic development is a priority. It is one of six priorities. Undergraduate excellence uh, is a priority. Uh, providing capacity for explosive growth is a priority. There are six uh, priorities uh, that we have uh, identified. We have not gone through a process to suggest one is better uh, than the other, although we did take pains uh, to make sure that the num that the first strategic goal uh, was excellence in undergraduate education. Any other questions? Could um, are you in town the rest of the week? Uh, no, sir. Uh, I am not. I have to uh, fly up to uh, Washington uh, midweek for an uh, energy policy uh, discussion. So there's no time this week. How about next week? Um, I believe I'm in next week. Okay, we'd like to do this again okay. and, and arrange for your chair <laughs> in the beginning. So uh, any other members have questions? Thank you. Meeting adjourned. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it.